Welcome to another edition of Dream Up, coming to you from KABF 88.3 FM in Little Rock, nationally syndicated and internationally streamed. It's where everyone has a success story, from celebrities to experts to average Joes and Janes. Today, our very special guest is former editor of both Esquire and Entertainment Weekly magazines, and he's a multiple New York Times bestselling author. We're talking number ones for real, Mr. AJ Jacobs. Okay, well, I'll find Hey, AJ <laughs> Jacobs. Oh, man, I love <laughs> Multiple applauds. <laughs> yeah, there you I'm go. so glad to have him with us. I actually, he, I think he's one of the most interesting people in general. He's the guy yeah. I want to sit down with and have five dinners with because I don't think I can get enough of what he's learned in life and what he's experienced in life to, to, to have it in one seating. It's like, I, you just read what he's done and you're like wow this guy's experienced it all man i'm i'm so excited to have aj jackets and, and, and i was mentioning to you before the show not only is he a success on um, in all these arenas but he also is incredibly kind this is probably the sixth time i've interviewed him over the last you know few years and this guy i mean he should be somebody that you have to go through his publicist and all that garbage that we usually have to go through. And nope, I could just text him anytime. And he always comes through and always is enthusiastic about it. So he's somebody who really believes in, you know, paying it forward to other people and giving them a help, you know? So, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I appreciate his his scope of work over the years. The yeah. books he's written, the, the articles and columns he's written. And he's just amazing to me. I love it. I love it. So yeah. glad to have him on. Good book, and Carl. Way to go. Yeah, well, I'm go. one of your hosts, Carl uh, Double Portion. Well, Kozlowski. introduce yourself. I am. Uh, I'm yeah. one of your hosts, Carl Double Portion Kozlowski, because I'm supersized, and I want to have a double portion of blessings from the Lord. I'm in Little Rock, and with me from Hollywood is... From Hollywood. Ron, the mirthful married man, Pearson. Buddy, I had a show last night, which was great. Oh, you did? Down in, uh, down in San Clemente. I have one tonight in San Diego. And then I'm running a church service on Saturday night. I'm actually really excited, but there's so much going on. You know, I'm ADHD, right? And yeah. I am just swimming in all this ADHD, trying to keep everything going right now. Sure. Brother. Uh, it's like I found out, I found out that the ADHD brain is always looking for dopamine right? Because the prefrontal cortex of the brain isn't lit up as much as a normal brain. You know what the prefrontal cortex is, Carl? No, it's what the is front it? part, the, the reason and logic part of your brain. So if we were to scan your, your brain, it would be a lot more active than my brain because I have ADHD. So um, oh, okay. that's why they put us on, on uh, prescription drugs. I'm not on any, <laughs> but they put, a, they put people with ADHD. But basically, you know what it is? What? It's speed. Oh, yeah. It, it, so you're giving speed to, to someone who's hyperactive. Does that even make sense? <laughs> like I think speed. Of the, <laughs> hey, let's give speed to the hyperactive kid and see what happens. It's like, wow, you know, but I guess it doesn't make sense. But alcohol is a depressant that makes you feel good. Does that make yeah. sense? No, Two bombs don't make a right. But two rights made an airplane, three rights made a left, and only people with ADHD are following me right now. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I've got, I, actually, I deal with ADHD also, plus I've got the fun of bipolar disorder, so it's like I've got a whole chemical laboratory going on in my head that's like, you know, pharmaceuticals love me. I'm like the poster child for, hey, let's see how much money we can make off one person. It's just unbelievable. Well, that's funny you say that because I was never diagnosed as a kid with it. So I was untreated, but yeah. not necessarily. Thank you, Mountain Dew, by the leader, <laughs> Chug Lug. I don't do Mountain Dew anymore. I really, oh, really? don't. Now I, uh, I, I do, uh, no, now I do Starbucks. So because oh. it's so much more, how shall we say, expensive. <laughs> yeah. No, how shall we say, sophisticated, the Starbucks. You know, I'll oh. have the venti blonde roast with a triple shot of espresso it has a ring to it doesn't it yeah <laughs> it, it does anyway i yeah, just Mountain i got my iced tea right now here yeah well mountain dew's also got that kind huh? of uh 
uh, I don't I don't know. It's sold everywhere, but in the South, it is like white trash nectar. It's just unbelievable. Everybody drinks it like a million pounds of it. Well, that's why I went to Starbucks because now I don't now I don't have to wear the snapback hat and the tank top. I can just <laughs> wear whatever I'm wearing. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, hey, so, so uh, do you have hey, a get, yeah quote of the week? I was going to ask. Or what? Quote, quote of the week. Okay, I love this quote. This is great. I wish Antonio was with us today because he kind of really lives by this in a big way, uh, just getting to know him. Um, the quote is, strive not to be success, but rather of value. Strive not to be success, but rather of value. Who said it? Who do you think said it? Um, of value. I would say Sam Walton, because he's Mr. Low Prices and all that. No? The founder of Walmart. <laughs> That's a good guess. That's well, of course, guess. I'll say that because no, I work actually, at Walmart also. That's my that's my free kiss up, uh, kiss ass plug to Walmart of the week. No, but who, who said it? Right, right, right. Well, it was Albert Einstein. What? Isn't that interesting? Albert Einstein. Yeah. Another uh, another quote Albert Einstein had was uh, he, he uh, recognized the most powerful force in the universe. What do you think it is? Compound uh, interest. Compound oh, interest, that? the most powerful it's how you make money, man. Compound interest uh, and time. You give it time, and it really ramps up. But it's funny. He knew all about the powerful forces in the world, in the world, in the universe. But he didn't know the power of hair care products. My goodness, <laughs> that guy yeah. could comb his hair with an egg beater. <laughs> it's amazing. Yep, yep. So well, strive not to be success, but rather a value. What does that What does that phrase mean to you, Carl? Because I, I think we, me, and Antonio had a talk with you about that a few years back. And yeah we were all well basically together. yeah we used to work on a radio show in los angeles together and um i was i don't know i mean i i to, to quote it was uh, antonio's friend andres who was assisting him at the time and he said carl you're you know there's givers and takers in life and you're a taker and i was somebody i was always because i was like in la and uh always struggling not to be broke I wound up asking too often, hey, can I get another chunk of money? Can I get this or that? You know, And instead of like thinking of, well, how can I be of service and actually be invaluable and, you know, have people want to give me money uh, or whatever, you know, their time, their assistance in various ways because I'm providing for them. And I think that once he taught me that, that's that really stuck with me. And I was like, wow, you know, I really am sort of a, take her across the board. Um, and uh, I really I prayed to how to change that mentality. And now I'm somebody that, you know, I'm told I really make an effort, to, like I really w w worked hard on Antonio's uh, congressional campaign last year. And I didn't ask for a dime. I just, you know, went and uh, did all sorts of media work for him. And well, Walmart, I, I can personally there. say you were yeah. a you were of huge value during that. I'm so impressed. Well, thank you. It was great. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I think that's, that's so the you became a giver. Is, you know, yeah, looking to be a giver in life. That's what uh, will ultimately give value. You know, it's like you put it out there and it'll come back, I think. So, you know. Yeah. 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 That, but, I love um, it. I love it. Well, I love that yeah. quote today and I love it and uh, very, very happy with, with that one. So, that's shall awesome. we roll? Yeah, so every week we like to talk about two or three stories in the news that are about achieving a dream or failing in a funny way. And uh, so and now the news, our lead story is about an 80 year old man named Mike Palin, who is a power lifter at age 80. He can still pump 800 pounds and inspire seniors to hit the gym. So it's amazing. He said that uh, he uses his own special techniques to, to, rate, to uh, lift those weights. And he said that back when he was uh, in the 50s, like 60 years ago, when he was young enough to compete for the Olympics, he wanted to be the Olympics. And at that time, he was only, only able to do 315 in the clean and jerk, 265 in military press, and the snatch was a tough lift, but I did a total of 235. 
and uh, now he's like doing 765 pounds uh, with power lifting. It's just crazy. But he says That's it's his insane, way of not saying Carl. Yeah, he, he says it's his way of not letting himself get old. At 80 years old, lifting yeah. 800 pounds. I can lift 800 pounds. Not all at once. I do it six pounds at a time. So <laughs> exactly. I just take my time. <laughs> yeah. And it's hey, the way I look at it, it's not how much you lift, it's your consistency. If you're consistent, it all adds up over time, right? Yeah. <laughs> Carl, can you could you even imagine doing that? I think you can you can lift, I believe you, Carl, could lift 800 pounds one crispy cream at a time. <laughs> Don't you think? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm actually, I'm trying to go well, to the gym, you know, but I'm, I'm nowhere near 800 pounds. My trainer's like, yeah, why don't you try 40? So that's, that's about where my, my speed is. I'm 30 years younger than this guy and I'm able to lift actually, 120th. What? Well, who cares? At least you're doing it right. I mean, I think it's yeah. great. How much, you told me you just lost a bunch of weight. How much, how many pounds did you just lose? Uh, I've lost seven pounds in three weeks. I mean, you know, that's, they say two pounds a week is what Come you on, should that's expect. that's fantastic. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's so great. I'm also doing, I'm also Way doing Weight Watchers. Where you go? And you're going. Yeah. So I'm doing Weight oh, Watchers yeah? and I'm you doing like a it? gym. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because you have this point system. That's great. When you're a big, giant balloon like I am, you get to start out eating 45 points of food a day. But as you lose weight, like once I get down to like 200, I'll be having to eat just 23 points a day and I'll be miserable. So Weight Watchers makes you happy when you're fat. And then as you lose weight, you wind up getting depressed by how much you're not allowed to eat. But I guess they <laughs> offset it with, hey, you're happy that you actually lost weight. So it works out. You know? Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, I just think this guy is a great example. You know, he's 80 years old. He's doing, he's still performing at top peak. That is just so inspirational, you know, and they say exercise releases endorphins in your brain, which makes you feel good for over 24 hours when you do go out and exercise rigorously. It's so awesome. Um, I just love it. Uh, do you, and the fact of his age is really impressive to me. I, I did an event in New York City. I do a lot of corporate events with my comedy yeah. and uh, I was hosting a giant award show for the biggest marketers in the country. And I gave a lifetime achievement award to a guy that was around 99-ish years old. Wow. And when I read his bio, I realized he did everything from 50 years old to 99 years old. Like all those things he had achieved in those years. And he came up with so many life-changing things from 50 on most people think oh it's 50 i'm kind of washed up i'm down i'm going downhill from here this guy just started at 50. he created the 1-800 number that was his what? idea the wow. columbia record house 13 record giveaway was his idea and several more and I, I honestly i whispered in his ear i said i'm so honored to be here next year you're such an inspiration and that's what i think this uh this weightlifter is to me he's like wow, he's still going out there and doing it. And what, what a great story for Dream Up because age should be irrelevant. You can, you know, have plans and hopes and dreams and do them when you want to, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, I think that uh, my dad is 83 and, uh, and he like gets up, like springs awake at like six in the morning and, you know, does all sorts of things all day long. You know, and he says, and we're telling him, hey, take it easy. Get a maid. Don't worry about cleaning the whole house. And he goes, well, what would I do then? Uh, you know, that the, the being active and taking care of everything that he always has taken care of, he keeps his mind sharp and keeps him moving and keeps him physically, you know, fit. And, it, you know, so I think a lot of people, they overdo it in, the, in getting lazy when they're retired. You know, like, yeah, you'd be glad you're not having to work anymore, but don't get too laid back where you're not doing anything because then you lose a sense of purpose and you also just, you know, blimp out yeah. and become kind of useless. So, you know, I this guy it. really I showing it. up well, to do it. Good for your dad and good for this guy. I love it. Yeah. I love it. That's well, speaking a great of, story. Well, speaking of uh, blipping out and becoming useless, it's a perfect intro 
for our next story, lead story two, Electric Boogaloo. So McDonald's has had this trend the last few years of teaming up with celebrities like the notorious Travis Scott. Uh, but they wish they could take that one back. But they, they team up with celebrities and come up with men, uh, certain menu uh, selections that supposedly appeal to the star in question. Well, they've outdone themselves this time. They've teamed up with Mariah Carey, who's become like a master of Christmas music. And they've come up with the idea. Uh, I don't really know what the title is. I couldn't find it, but let's call it the 12 Days of Mariah because it's tied to Christmas season. <laughs> and for 12 days during the Christmas season, they will be offering one of their most popular menu items each day, a different item for 12 straight days. If you just make a $1 purchase on the McDonald's app, and that's basically, you know, buy a soft drink and you can have- You get the and, food for free? Yeah, you oh, buy- You get the $1 food for the free app. if you make a $1 purchase? Yeah, $1 I'm trying purchase to, on the app. That is amazing. Yeah, and it's everything amazing. from one day it's a, it's a Big Mac, another day it's a McDouble, another day it's the cheeseburger, another day, it, it's just crazy. It's like their best food all for free through, throughout the 12 days. So I know where I'm going to be living in December. You know where to find. <laughs> can you? I wonder if you can go through more than one time a day, Carl. You'll just be kind of making a loop through the drive-through. <laughs> well, there goes Weight Watchers, huh? It'll, it'll add to my yeah, inspiration yeah, yeah. for the new year. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I love it. Twelve days of Christmas. I love. McDonald's for free. I love yeah. Mariah Carey learning to love. I'm in like with her. I'm in like. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? When you get two great things that are powerful and put them together, like the 12 days of Christmas and free McDonald's, that's powerful. You put in three together, this is going to be a huge promotion for them. I can't, I can't even believe it. And because look how big Mariah Carey is. She was she's worth somewhere between three and four. $500 million. That will yeah. guess $400 million. She's the second best selling female artist of all time. Really? And I'm sitting here going, selling what? Is that music, prescription drugs, or hamburgers? Because I'm not sure which way it's going to fly. Yeah. <laughs> but well, uh, I mean, I, I just think it's surprised. great they put them all together. Man. Well, they call, it the, they call it the Mariah menu, is what I found. And you get your meal. Not only is it a great deal, but it comes in a fun and festive package inspired by Mariah's love for the holidays and chic style. I know that's the first time I've ever heard the word chic style applied to McDonald's, but hey, you know, they, 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 they can pull it off. More power to them. But well, uh, uh, hey, look, as far as connecting to as far as connecting to our show and dreaming up. It's great yeah. marketing for McDonald's. I mean, this sure. is amazing. I can't even see how they can make money by giving away that much food. Uh, that's amazing. And I think they're going to be giving away a lot of it. So I'm impressed. Yeah. It's, by the way, it's so helpful for people during the holidays that need to watch how much money they have and uh, families with inflation going up, they're doing this. What a brilliant, brilliant move. I just applaud it top to bottom. And, um, uh, Carl, how's this going to fit for you? And I mean, <laughs> you're trying to lose weight. You're going to be going, <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen, man. And then poor oh. Antonio, I don't even think he can get his order in if he was there because uh, they can't see him. He can't see over the counter. So I don't even know if he can get his order in. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I, I think that the McDonald's is out to inspire brand loyalty, you know, so they figure if they hook people, they come back, you know, appreciating this offer then they'll be, uh, you know, ready to be customers on an ongoing basis. You know, it makes them stand out. People will appreciate this and keep coming back rather than going to say Arby's or whatever. Well, let's go back to our stand. quote of the day. Yeah. Let's oh, go yeah, back to our quote value. of the day. Yeah. Be, be of value. And, yeah. and uh, they are being tremendously so. And I think it's going to pay off in spades for them by being of value. That's a great story, man. Way to go. Love it. Love All right. It, it. Well, hey, so I think that it's, we should get to our guest because he's got an uh, amazing life to share with us. And so, and now 
our guest. Oh, darn it. Oh, there. All right, so our, our guest this week is uh, one of my absolute favorite writers of all time. And he was editor of Esquire magazine, as well as uh, one of the top editors, or possibly the top editor at Entertainment Weekly. And then he went on to uh, write a string of New York Times bestselling books, uh, such as The Year of Living Biblically, The Know-It-All, and Drop Dead Healthy, so I can learn a lot from him. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, he's got a new book coming up called The Puzzler. <laughs> Give it up for AJ Jacobs. Thank you, Carl. Thank hey, you, Ron. Hey, hey. It is a delight to be here, and I'm a hey. big fan. Oh, thanks. So, um, no. yeah. So, so you're in uh, New York now, and you are just about to drop your new book, or you are you just finish it and turn it in now, or what? It'll be out in April, and it's all, right. all about uh, my obsession with puzzles. So I try to solve every puzzle on Earth, including the meaning of life, the ultimate puzzle. Wow. Huh. So, like, so <laughs> what sort of puzzles are we talking about? Like New York Times Sunday crossword, or you're talking something much more involved? Well, that's a start. Yeah, the New York Times crossword, but there are um, there are puzzles, crossword puzzles that make that look like a breeze, which is, really? yeah, they are crazy. And, it, you know, I, I struggle. I struggle with them, uh, but I love the struggle. So, uh, yeah, it's that. And I went to the CIA to wow. learn. They have a uh, one of the most famous unsolved puzzles in the world at their headquarters. Uh, I went to Spain and I participated as Team USA in the World Jigsaw Puzzle Championship. So I had a lot of adventures. Uh, up there. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. So I, what I, is the CIA puzzle? Where'd you get the idea for that, AJ? Well, that song Sorry, came Carl. about. Where'd you get the idea for that, AJ? I've always loved puzzles. The opening of the book describes how about five years ago, I was the answer to one down in the New York Times crossword puzzle. It was author AJ Blank, and it was me. Uh, and I was all excited. Um, but then my brother-in-law pointed out that it was the, uh, the Saturday puzzle. He did congratulate me, but the Saturday puzzle, as you might know, is the hardest of the whole week. And all the answers are totally obscure. So his, I think his implication was, this is just proof that I'm totally obscure. It's not a compliment. <laughs> so I, I had an emotional roller coaster there where I thought it was the greatest day of my life. And then I'm like, oh, I guess not. Huh. What, did, what did you think was the most uh, unusual puzzle that you encountered in the book? Oh, well, there are tons. I mean, it is fascinating. There's a whole cult of Japanese puzzle boxes, which are these wooden boxes uh, uh, that you have to slide and twist and spin to open them up. And they're sometimes about the size of a shoe box, but they can be big. They can be the size of a desk. And it's a whole cult of people who will pay thousands of dollars, up to $40,000 for these puzzle boxes. And there's nothing in them when you open them, there's usually maybe just a note saying like, congrats. But the, 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 the joy is in the struggle to open them. Wow, that's amazing. So- uh, Was there any puzzle you couldn't solve, AJ? Any puzzle you couldn't solve? Oh, there are tons. I mean, the one, uh, the CIA one has been there for 30 years and thousands of people have been trying to solve it. Even as we speak, there are people and I'm gonna guess, I'm gonna guess that was who killed JFK. <laughs> that is well, yes, that's a great point. Well, they did have, they have. Um, apparently, once you solve it, it is is a code to a buried treasure somewhere on the CIA ground. So, my theory was that it's the cigar that they sent to Castro, that uh, the poison cigar, but uh, oh, wow. that's unconfirmed. Wow, that's amazing. Wow. That's just rampant that speculation. Insane. Yeah, I'm just making that up. But I think that would be wow. cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, your book, your your book, your book is really amazing. That's such a great concept. It makes me want to get your book. 
among among your other books and and thank you for teeing us up on what what that's about uh, but let's kind of dig into who aj jacobs really is where right. are you from right. what did your father do how did you become a writer and how did you get in well let's just start with that and then we'll we'll add from there go ahead sure AJ. i grew up in new york city my father is a lawyer but he's He's a quirky guy. He holds the world record for the most number of footnotes in a law article, which is 4,824, it's very proud. He, uh, and he's obsessed with learning and reading. And, and that's actually, he was the inspiration for my first book because when I was a kid, he started to read the Encyclopedia Britannica and uh, just trying to learn everything in the world. And uh, he didn't quite finish. He made it up to the middle of the letter B, like around Bolivia or something. And then he said, you know, this is not, maybe not the best use of my time. So that was where I got the idea, right. like maybe I should finish what he began and try to, you know, remove that, that black mark from our family history. Well, and you managed, did you really manage how, to read it within a year? When, when he was reading it, I was probably nine years old. When I tried it, it I was like, uh, that's probably a 35, I would say. And I did, you know, it is a undertaking. I didn't quite uh, understand how big of an undertaking. Like this is the Everest of books. It is 33 volumes. Uh, it is 44 million words. Uh, so it was, uh, you know, my eyeballs were bleeding by the end, but, uh, but I did do it. I did not to give uh, the spoiler, but I did make it to the the end of the alphabet, which is uh, the last word in the encyclopedia is Zivich, Zivich, Z-Y-W-I-E-C-H, a uh, town in Poland that makes great beer, by the way, great beer, if you like beer. Oh, I've been there, I've been there. My, no. my dad's actually from Poland and I've had their beer, it's amazing. Yes. Are you serious? Yes, That's I That's fantastic. Yeah. What's it like? Do they know? I mean, I, this is 30 years ago, but I remember we just drank it like crazy because I was like 20 and in college and in a country where we were allowed to drink it younger than in America. <laughs> so yes, I sampled it plenty. Yeah. Wow. Are they proud that they're the last entry in the encyclopedia? I'm not sure if they know that. That's pretty wild. Though. Oh yeah. my goodness. You got to tell them. Yeah. Next time you're there. Yeah. So um, how okay. long did it take so you to do all the this? Oh, how long did it take me was the question. Yeah. Oh, it took me like a year and a half. Uh, wow. And I just read all the time. I actually was working full time at Esquire at the uh, at the time. But I read, you know, five hours a day on the weekdays and, and 15 on the weekends. And I would read you know, in the subway. And, and this was old school. I actually had the physical volumes, which they don't even make anymore. But uh, yeah, I would read, I'd take it into the bathroom. I'd take it, uh, you know, wherever I was, I was just reading. Wow. And so, uh, so uh, I want to know, I want to know, Carl, you and I seem to have a delay today, Carl, between yeah, our things. So every I time I speak, and then there's, I don't know what's happening. So keep your eyes and, and let's do it through eyes for yeah, who's sure. going to speak next. Mm. Um, Okay. Yeah, yeah, because there's some delay. It's just happening a lot. I'm sorry about that. But uh, okay. AJ, my question for you is, what did you learn from reading the entire Encyclopedia Britannica? Because you wrote that book, and that book is called, you know, what uh, the know-it-all, right? right. Uh, what's yeah, the title of that book again? The know-it-all, it is uh, One Man's Quest to Become the Smartest Person in the World, which, of course, I did not. But I did learn... Right. Right. I'll tell you in two parts. First, you know, I learned way too much. I learned, uh, you know, that uh, I was so full of knowledge that I tried to insert it into every conversation. So, you know, randomly I would bring up, oh, also opossums have 13 nipples. And people would be like, why are you telling me that? So my wife started to, um, to penalize me a dollar for every irrelevant fact. So uh, I've since forgotten 99.9% .9 of the facts, but I will tell you in addition to the opossums or in addition to the fact that the Bayer company, the aspirin company uh, invented heroin. It was uh, oh, wow. so 
that kind of random thing sticks in my mind. It was meant as a cough suppressant, wow. actually. Wow. Uh, but it apparently had some other effects. So, um, <laughs> but anyway, that I learned like way too much trivia, but I did learn some wisdom in addition to the trivia, some sort of big picture ideas. And one of them that I think about all the time is uh, that I am grateful to be alive now. Like it is, we got a lot of problems, but you read about all of human history, the good old days were not good. They were just terrible. They were smelly, yeah. dangerous, you know, they were violent. They were uh, you know, sexist, racist, you name it. They were just horrible. And if I'm feeling down, which, you know, often happens, I'll, I have a little three word mantra that I remember from my encyclopedia days, which was, uh, surgery without anesthesia because i read the section on surgery and they had a description of what it was like to undergo surgery before oh. anesthesia that you just don't want to experience so <laughs> so whenever i feel down about my wi-fi or the delay for instance in uh you know that we have a little zoom delay i'm like well at least i don't have surgery without anesthesia yeah why wow. so <laughs> Then, um, uh, so uh, that was your first book. Then, but I wanted to ask, like, you were in Magazine World at the same time as you were doing all the reading and all that. How did you know when it was time to make the leap from being a top editor at mega magazines to, uh, you know, taking your chances as an individual author? Because, I mean, that's a pretty big leap of faith, no? Well, I was, uh, I definitely kept my day job for the first couple of books. Uh, and then oh, yeah. I eventually did. I mean, I, I realized I, I liked some aspects of working in magazines, but I also, I was an editor. What I liked as an editor, and you might be able to relate to this as, as radio producers and hosts, you know, the part that I liked was coming up with ideas and framing them and, you know, brainstorming sessions. The part I did not like as much was hand-holding writer, whiny writers. And I include myself. I'm a whiny writer. I wouldn't want to have to babysit myself. So, yeah, I I much prefer being a writer. Uh, and I imagine with your show, you know, you've got the fun part is talking to people, but you've also got all this other crap you have to do, which might not be as enjoyable. Maybe you like it. Some people like that. So I don't want to assume, but I did not. No, wow. you, assume, you assume well. You assume well. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, so, so, how, so I asked you what you learned from, from writing that book, uh, The Know-It-All. How did it change you? Well, again, there was the gratitude aspect. There was also, it was very humbling because I realized how much I don't know. Like there is just an ocean of information that I have no idea about it. Uh, and one, one that still I think about is the uh, Taiping Rebellion, which maybe I'd heard of a little, but... Uh, <laughs> It happened in the, it was in China in the 1860s. So our civil war was going on and our civil war, horrible, terrible, 800,000 people died around. China was having a similar civil war where 20 million people died. And I just had never heard of it. And I'm like, wow, there's a whole world out there. What the one angle that I still do remember is the people, the general who put down the Taiping Rebellion was named General So, who you oh. might know from his chicken. So those, wow. that's how he lives on, is uh, in his chicken. But, <laughs> but he, he was a little more important historically in that he put down this revolution. Well, thank God he also had great taste in food. It's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, it's Ron. funny you bring that up because what I heard, you said the Taiping Rebellion, and I thought it was typing. And I go, mm -hmm. ooh, there's some sort of rebellion against people who don't like typewriters. <laughs> and that just made me laugh. And then you brought in a whole rebellion, like you said, 20 million people died. I'd never even heard of it. Uh, that's so it's fascinating. Crazy. Like you said, it's there crazy. is uh, 
an ocean of information. So you made this leap uh, a, a couple steps at a time. So you were a big editor of great magazines, worldwide known, and now you're writing your books. Your first book is this, and you try another book before you quit your day job. What is your second book coming out of that? My second book, and I've talked to Carl, I love talking to Carl about this because he's got <laughs> lots of great insights. My second book was called The Year of Living Biblically. And this one was, I grew up with very little religion, but I decided to learn about religion by totally diving in and immersing myself and living like they did back in biblical times. So I followed all the rules of the Bible as literally as possible uh, for an entire year. And I, it was, it was fascinating. It was horrible at times, but also wonderful at other times. And I looked insane. I had a huge are, are you married at the time when you decide to do this? Are you married and say, this is I, what I'm doing? How does your, what? Is, yeah, my wife had very ahead. mixed feelings about it. I mean, there are some parts of the Bible that, that I hope made me a little bit of a better person. Like, you know, I try not to gossip and lie and, as, and covet as much, but but, you know, there were all these laws in the Old Testament that you cannot touch a woman who is menstruating. And if you take Leviticus really seriously, you should not even sit in a seat where a woman who has had her period has sat. And my wife found that offensive. And so she sat in every seat in our apartment. Uh, so then I had to stand for the whole year. <laughs> so she had issues with parts of it, for sure. Wow. So it was, what was, well, what was some of the world still lives? Carl? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, what, what, me, what was uh, something? I'm just going to say, uh, much of the world, <laughs> this delay. Okay. Go ahead, Ron. Go ahead, Carl. <laughs> we'll, we'll edit out all these pauses. <laughs> sorry. No, so uh, yeah. I was going to ask, like, what was the maybe the most meaningful thing? That you learned uh, from the Bible, like what what affected you into your you know personal uh, life that wasn't just funny but actually gave you know had an impact on you. What well, I love that there are lots of things that still affect me. I, I think it changed me in a big way. One that comes to mind is just the idea of gratitude, uh, because the Bible talks several times about how you should be grateful for everything and I took it to the extreme and the, I was literally I'd be I'd press the elevator button and be grateful that the elevator came to the lobby I'd get in the elevator and be grateful it didn't uh, crash to the basement and break my collarbone so you know you, there are hundreds of things that go right every day that we take for granted and when you really start to concentrate that's when you notice them. And, and it actually spawned a later book all about gratitude. But that was my first uh, experience with this idea of really radical gratitude. Wow, that's great. So go, go ahead, Ron. That's beautiful. No, that's, that's so beautiful. I'm just going to say, in the world today, you know, you talk about biblical and everybody thinks old, old school, but I've been to Israel a few times. I've done shows across Israel and tours and, and, and uh, you know, they still in some areas uh, take many of those laws very, very seriously. Uh, in my act, in my comedy act, I bring people on stage and touch them, but uh, many of the women are Shomer Nagia. I'm sure you're mm -hmm. familiar yeah. with the concept of Shomer Nagia, which is no male is allowed to touch a woman other than her husband, even before she's married. So growing up, it's only her husband that's allowed to touch her. And um, that's a male anyway. And uh, so I would have to ask when I'm picking a volunteer, is anyone not Shomer Nagia in the crowd? And it always <laughs> gets such a laugh because in some of the places I would do shows, um, we're uh, very observant uh, Jewish group and sometimes not if it's in Tel Aviv it's no problem but in right. some of the locations it was tough to find a woman that was not Shomer Nagia and uh, so 
do you do you sometimes look around New York now and go, oh, well, that's biblical. People are living this way now. People are still doing this here. Uh, are you seeing that? Yeah, no, it's fascinating. Things? I, mean, I, for, I love that story. Uh, and that sounds amazing. And like you say, there the Bible is still probably one of the most influential books, maybe the most influential book. And and you see it in you see it in all sorts of communities. So you see it in the Hasidic Jews, but you also see it in uh, you know the Amish. I went to visit the Amish, and they um, and they won't take photographs partly because of the Second Commandment says that you shall not make any image. Uh, or, or an engraved image depends how you train. so they don't want to make any images uh so it is fascinating to see how it has remained you know for two thousand years it's still this incredibly uh influential book and and part of my thesis was uh that it is um it's you know there there's lots of wonderful stuff in the bible for you to follow but you don't have to follow everything. Uh, and there's this phrase, cherry picking. You know, you're just cherry picking the parts of the Bible you like. And my argument was, what's wrong with picking cherries? You know, you want, that's the whole point. You want to pick the good cherries. You want to pick the delicious cherries about compassion and gratitude and loving your neighbor and helping others and being a good person. You, you know, you don't have to pick the cherries about how homosexuality is a sin or women shouldn't talk in church. You know, those are both cherries you can find in the Bible. So that was part of my, my uh, thesis was, you know, pick your cherries, but pick them, uh, try to pick the compassionate ones. Were you using the New Testament as well as the Old Testament, meaning the Christian addition to, because the Jews, uh, it, 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 what the Christian Jews call the Old Testament is the Jewish scriptures, right? right. And so uh, I'm, which did you use out of that? Well, I am Jewish. As I say in the book, I'm Jewish, but I'm Jewish in the same way the Olive Garden is Italian. So not very. <laughs> so I, I didn't have a lot of religious <laughs> upbringing, which is partly why I wanted to do this. But I did, since I am Jewish, I felt uh, I concentrated mostly on the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament. Uh, I did do some on the New Testament. If I were going to do it again, I might even do two different books. Um, but yeah, the New Testament doesn't have as many rules, but it's, it's just as challenging in its own way. Uh, so things like Jesus talking about forgiveness. I mean, forgiveness is so crazy hard. Uh, or love your enemies. I mean, how do you do that? That was a huge challenge. And, uh, you know, of course, you can never achieve it perfectly, but it is, it is a really good exercise to try. And I think forgiveness, along with gratitude, those, those are two of the most amazing emotions. Well, let me circle back to the cherry picking section. Yeah. Because uh in the to me the scriptures for what i follow them right so i follow the old testament and the new and they both need to be together to work because the old testament was the law mm -hmm. and the new testament is grace mm. so if you're following all the laws it's really difficult how do you follow there's thousands of laws in the scriptures and some of them are crazy. Like you said, I can't sit on a seat. So your wife was offended. So she sat on every seat. So you had to stand. It can be really difficult. But the New Testament's focus is the grace part. Just like you said, love your enemies, forgiveness, all those things is the grace. So if you just had grace and didn't have the law, grace has no value. And if you just had the law and have no grace, it's so rigid, it's almost impossible. So my addendum to your thing is rather than just cherry picking, I say each thing is in there for a specific reason and all together is what creates the, the perfect, I'll say heart, I'll call it a heart, the perfect heart uh, to live by. 
uh, in, in, in my world. And I'm just so fascinated. Someone took an entire year and took it to the extreme like you did. Not yeah. raised in a religious home. Let me dive into it. I'm so impressed with you. It's it's amazing. I, I just oh well, thank you. Yeah, taking it was... back. Carl, ask a question. <laughs> thank you, Ryan. Yeah, well, I want to jump to uh, another one of your books, um, the Drop Dead Healthy, because I'm rereading that right now because um, I, I I basically had an amazing experience last year where um, I wound up uh, having a severe, I'll, I'll just admit it, I'm pretty open about it. I had like a, a basically an emotional or mental breakdown at the start of 2020. And um, and when I, and my parents were kind enough to let me come home, I'm now back on my own, you know, out here though. And, um, and my dad helped me by taking me to doctors. Like he's a retired doctor and he called in every specialist. It was almost doing what you did, only we were be, having to be dead serious about it. And he was like, okay, check out his heart, check out his eyes, check out this and that, because I had diabetes that I wasn't keeping up with. And thank God I was okay with everything in that regard. But mentally, I learned at age 49 that I'm bipolar. And so for the first time in my life, I'm on proper medicine and I'm doing much better than I ever have in my entire life. So I find this right now that I got the, the mental down, I'm trying to get the physical back again. And I joined Weight Watchers three weeks ago and I got myself a trainer and I've lost like seven pounds in three weeks, which is, awesome. you know, not, not earth shattering, but uh, Weight Watchers, that's what they say, go for two pounds a week and you'll be more likely to keep it off. But um, I just find the book really inspiring. And I was wondering uh, what motivated you to do that book uh, in the first place? Well, first of all, you're inspiring. I love that story. And I love you. that you are so Agreed. open. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's great for people to hear. You know, you're very successful. You have this amazing career, and uh, thank you. Uh, and that that you are so open about uh, your struggles. And and I want to echo that. You know, I've struggled with depression for for many years. I'm not. I I don't think I'm depressed particularly now. I go through like everyone ups and yeah. downs, but but it's important that people should not feel alone. Uh, yeah. But anyway, yeah, the um, that book came about because I, uh, for most of my life, I just ignored my body. I just saw it as a a vehicle to carry around my brain. But then uh, I got very sick. I got pneumonia, uh, and uh, my wife said, "You know, your immune system is like." It's like a, you know, a hotel. It's just welcomes the germs in. Like you gotta, <laughs> yeah. you gotta, you gotta get uh, healthy. You gotta do something. So I was like, all right. Well, if I'm gonna do this, why not turn it into a book? Why not try out every uh, piece of medical advice uh, and see what works and what doesn't? Why not? So I, I, I changed everything in my behavior. I changed the way I ate, the way I exercise. Well, I didn't exercise before. Started how I exercise, how I uh, slept, how I went to the bathroom. I changed how I went to the bathroom, I, how I breathe. So I just tried to affect every little part of my life. And it was a full-time job, you know, which was actually not that healthy to be obsessed with health all the time. Uh, that was one of the takeaways. But it was, yeah, it was like, you know, every moment of my waking uh, life was devoted to trying to be healthy. And, and it, was, it was fascinating and I learned a lot and I, I took away a lot of wisdom. Uh, as I say, one of the pieces of wisdom is don't be too obsessed with your health. There are other things in life that you, uh, that you should take care of. But like if you're so obsessed that you're with health that you're going to the gym six hours a day and and you won't go out to eat with friends because you'll only eat, you know, a certain type of organic asparagus, you know, that's not healthy because going out with friends is very important to your health. That is having a social network is uh, tied to a, a longevity and the immune, you know, it is hugely important to have friends or family that support you. So it's not all about 
exercise and food. There's a lot more to it. Yeah. So uh, go ahead, Ron, if you got an idea here. Well, I, I just, I wanted to just kind of say your style of work uh, as a journalist is not what most journalists do. Most journalists uh, talk to someone, they think about it, and they write it in a story that people can understand. You are doing this type of journalism that's called, I guess it's called immersive journalism, where you throw yourself into the life and the lifestyle. So I think the question is, it's experience versus head knowledge. And how much different do you think your perceptions of things once you've experienced them are versus the old school style of talking to someone and writing down their view? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, and I, I actually love both. And uh, so I think, you know, if you're writing about uh, an article about France, then it's good to read the history of France and read the, you know, how many people live in Paris. But if you're really going to get to know it, why, why not go and have some croissants or, uh, you know, like uh, go to a go to the Moulin Rouge, whatever. So yeah, I find that for me, getting to know a topic, I like to combine the two approaches. So, uh, you know, I could have written a book about the Bible that just from reading, you know, there's millions of pages of Bible commentary, but I would never have gotten to experience what it's like to, uh, to walk in the sandals. Uh, and, you know, I would have never gotten to experience, you know, even just like having a beard was a fascinating, uh, a beard of that was fascinating insight into the way millions of people live. Yeah. Did your um, wife like the beard or no? She did <laughs> not like the beard at all. She <laughs> wouldn't kiss me for about seven months of my life. She wouldn't even, she's just this gross topiary on. So she was very happy at the end when I, I shaved it off. Yeah. And what is the process? Like, uh, I'm just curious, like trying to visualize like you lopping off that big of a beard. Did you go to a barber shop or did you do it yourself or? I did it myself, but it was a long process. It took a couple of hours. First, I went at it with the shears. And then I, when I got it down, I shaved it. And I actually, uh, I'm hoping none of your listeners are eating lunch now, but uh, I kept it in a bag because it was such a big part of my life. I wanted to, uh, so I have actually my beard stored in a bag under the sink. If anyone ever wants to come over and see it. Locks of love. I tried. I tried. They said they were not interested. It was very sad. What? Well, oh. apparently the, the length of the hairs has to be a certain length and beard hairs, I guess, are not long enough. Oh, geez. That's tragic. Tragic. Yeah. The so greatest you tragedy had a of series our time. Of essays that, you, you had a series of essays that seemed to follow our experience versus head knowledge question there. And it was called, My Life as an Experiment, One Man's Humble Quest to Improve Himself. I kind of see you as a person that is constantly seeking knowledge, constantly, uh, you're, you're a lifelong learner and um, you, you're just such a fascinating person. I would love to have dinner with you sometime just to Thank you, your brain on so I'd many love topics. That. I, um, but, Fill us in on one man's humble quest to improve himself that my life is an experience because did, didn't you follow George Washington's rules for life in that? And what were they? Uh, am I, I did that essay wrong or no, no, you are absolutely correct. And it was, uh, yeah, that book was just a series of experiments. So maybe 10 different shorter term, instead of a year, I would spend a month doing something. And one of them was, when he was young, George Washington wrote 110 rules uh, for life, of, of a civil life, and they are fascinating. And I said, yeah, he was an impressive man. Well, maybe I should try to follow his, uh, his life rules. And, uh, 
and in some ways it made my life better. They were, uh, I remember there were, um, you know, there was a lot that you would expect, like respect the elderly. There was a lot about do not gloat, which when you win, do not gloat, which he was during the Civil War. I mean, uh, the Revolutionary War, the soldiers really wanted to gloat after every victory. And he said, no, you know, have respect. Uh, so I love that. Others were less expected. The number two rule in George Washington's list of 110 rules is do not adjust your private parts in public. <laughs> really? That is literally, <laughs> it's worded slightly differently, but it's like, but yeah, don't play pocket pool. Don't like go down and adjust yourself. And oh, I'm man. like, well, that is, you know, it's solid advice, <laughs> but I'm not sure I would put it number two you know, of like all the rules in the in the world. But I guess at that time, it really was a, a bigger problem. Uh, so, uh, you know, it was it was a fascinating experiment to try to get in the mindset of uh, of what it was like back then. Wow. And then you did a book about uh, where you were trying to trace the family tree, you called it It's All Relative Adventures Up and Down the World's Family Tree. And you found connections with thousands of people, correct? I mean, that, what, was, yeah. what was that like? Well, that one was a fascinating, that started because I got an email out of the blue and it was from a man who said, uh, I don't, you don't know me, I've never met you, but I've read your books and I figured out that you are my 12th cousin. And I figured, all right, well, he's, you know, next is he's gonna ask me for to wire $10,000 to Nigeria. But it's, it, it turned out he was legit. He was like a real um, researcher who was working on the family tree. And it was not, it's not a family tree anymore. It's a family forest because it is not, it's not hundreds of people. It, it connects thousands, millions of people. It's the biggest family tree in the world. It's literally wow. 200 million people all connected. And I was just blown away. Uh, I mean, part of me was like, oh, God, do I want these? Rel I already have a lot of relatives. I'm not so sure <laughs> I want. So having 200 million new relatives, <laughs> that's good. But the other part of me said, you know, we've always had the, heard the cliche that humans are one family. Um, uh, and and actually for religious people, I'm not particularly religious, but there's the idea that we're all children of God. Uh, so I thought this is so fascinating. Now science is catching up and showing how we are actually all related. And you can, it's like six degrees of Kevin Bacon. You know, I, I could figure out, uh, this is a true uh, fact I am. Uh, Barack Obama is my fifth great aunt's husband's brother's wife's seventh great nephew. So that is how we are related. And everyone, you, I'm related to you, Ron. I'm related to you, Carl. It's just a matter of figuring out how. And the hope is when people re realize this, that they'll be a little kinder to each other. Wow. That's that makes great. sense. And I'm really mad for you that you never got the invite to the White House after being <laughs> a relative like that. I know. Where is it? Where is I'm still waiting. I did invite him to my party um, oh. and he was he was busy, but uh, he, <laughs> yeah, he was well. welcome. <laughs> That's great. Well, well, so um, hey, your, your body of work in your life is so amazing as uh, a writer you've experienced things most people wouldn't even dream of and it's so impressive and you're still married through all that which is even more impressive <laughs> so there's another kudos to you but thank you Ron. We're, our show's about dreaming up and you're welcome but our show's about dreaming up so now let's go forward 10 years in aj jacobs life what goal would you like to have achieved and what would you have liked to have done in that 10 years? Well, first of all, I love the theme of your show and, uh, and I fully support it. I guess what's changed in my life is um, in my 20s, I was, I was a bit of an asshole, I think, an a-hole. I don't want to uh, get you the explicit, but I was very concerned with myself and that's pretty much it my own happiness, my own success. And 
yeah, I still am a, a selfish person because I think that's wired into us, but I fight it. I fight it hard and I really try to think about others. And so my, my hope is in 10 years that I will be spending a lot of my time trying to make the make other people's lives better uh, and uh, you know sort of continue in the direction that I'm going now where uh, I am yeah just uh, concerned about the the greater good, not just about myself and not even about my family, which I also am concerned about, but the whole human family. So that would be my my dream for myself. Wow, well, that's great, AJ. And we want to thank you for taking the time and having this amazing conversation with us. Uh, so uh, everybody take a look for at ajjacobs.com to find all about AJ and his many great books and look out for his new book, The Puzzler, when it comes out next April. And so I want to thank Ron uh, Pearson for uh, co-hosting, as always, with me. I'm Carl Kozlowski, and we want to say thanks to KABF 88.3 FM in Little Rock and to everyone for listening. Thanks and have a good week.